Hey everyone and welcome to another video. Today we're doing something quite spicy. I uh, received this message from one of my MLS clients saying, Curtis, check out this skill cap video. So uh, I'm intrigued, I was intrigued. I actually clicked on the video. I watched the first about first half of it and I thought, you know what? This would make a very interesting reaction video because I think there's many, many things that I think I differ in terms of my opinion on, on things here with skill capped. I don't actually watch much skill cap content. Um, so it'll be very interesting to, to kind of share my thoughts. Let's get into the video, guys, and let's see what we can take away from this one. Analyzed over 100 replays of Faker's games and discovered a secret technique that he uses to stomp solo crazy keys. I was then sent right to the depraved depths of low elo North American rank games to test this strategy to see if they work for us regular mortals playing with bad teammates. On top, You already know that it's going to be a banger when you see a high elo player go into a lower elo bracket. I've made this mistake myself. I made a piece of content smurfing in a lower elo bracket. Bracket. It's an absolute disaster. You already know that it's, a, it, it's not going to... It's it's so hard for a high elo player to show concepts in a lower elo bracket because of all the intuition and things that they have inside their brain and all the muscle memory and pattern recognition. It's so, so, so difficult. So whenever I see a high elo person smurfing in a lower elo bracket to make content, I already know we're, re we're in for something special. Of that, I was not allowed to just spam games and cherry pick the ones where the strategy worked. All the replays of mine that you're going to see in this guide were from the first six games I played. This way, it makes sure that what you're about to learn is not only consistently effective, but also it shows that this strategy will be easy to execute without having to spend hundreds of games to master. Spoiler alert, I won every game. This technique is overpowered and Faker is a god. So what is this secret strategy Faker uses? Well, it's what I like to call the smother technique. Tell me if this problem doesn't sound like something you've gone through many times before. At some point in your games, you'll be stronger than the opposing laner. Maybe they're low on health, or you have an item or level lead. But the problem is, they just play very safe at their tower, and you're not so far ahead that you can just straight up tower dive them. What exactly are you supposed to do in these scenarios? Should you just repeatedly push waves into their tower and then roam? Or maybe just push into then recalling instead? Or maybe you just force the tower dive anyways? How exactly do you convert a small lead in lane into a bigger game-winning advantage? Well, the answer is none of the things I just told you. You see, the biggest mistake you and every other player is making is forcing a play that's not there. For I actually somewhat agree with this. I do agree um, that a lot of people force plays when they're ahead. They feel like, oh my god, if I can't kill this guy on repeat right now, then I'm losing. You know, they're not okay with incremental leads or small leads. They feel like they need to do something crazy. And you'd see this especially in the very low elo brackets. You see it in silver and gold. But funnily enough, you've all seen it in Diamond. I actually did a Diamond review this morning with someone that was really far ahead, even like, I think even got the mid tower or something like that. And then they just forced dumb play after dumb play. So I will give them credit. It actually is a very common problem. I, I don't know if it's the biggest problem, but it is a pretty significant problem. For example, if you force a roam that doesn't work, that will let the opponents push the next wave, denying you all that CS and giving them a recall timing to get back to full health or catch up on items. If you just push and recall, the enemy will clean up the wave at the tower, then match your recall. No advantage gained. Oh, I, I, you know, there's a few little things here. Just going back, if, if I see someone fail a roam, well, I'd be asking, well, what made that roam fail? Was it because you roamed onto the weak side of the map? You didn't actually look at the size of the wave? Did you play away from your jungle's location? There's always a reason why a, a, a roam fails. Just, roaming, shoving, or stacking a wave into roaming isn't necessarily a bad thing to do. It just very much depends on the situation. Um, which is, you know, getting into the details is going to be one of the themes of this video here. And giving them a recall timing to get back to full health or catch up on items. If you just push and recall, the enemy will clean up the wave at the tower, then match your recall. No advantage gained. That's also not necessarily how it works as well. If you actually stack a massive wave, you do maybe a two or three stack, three stacked wave, you can actually reset, come back, and then the wave will be bouncing back onto your side. And then you can set up a freeze and then deny them farm and zone them. So that's actually something you can do. Just because shoving and recalling doesn't necessarily mean it's a net neutral. That's only the case if the wave dies completely and the wave just goes back to neutral. So that's not always the case either. And if you force a tower dive that isn't there, well, you just threw your entire lane. So this seems like an impossible problem, right? Like no matter what you do, the enemy gets to neutralize your advantage and just recover. And again, I want to emphasize, this is one of the biggest reasons why you're stuck at your current. I This is what I'm genuinely curious. Like what rank is this video targeted at? Is this a VOD? Is this a, a video for silver players? Is this a video for diamond players? I, I, you know, this is what I'm genuinely curious about because I don't really 
understand already. I mean, I'm getting mixed messages here. This sounds to me that we're potentially going into something that's quite complicated, but then there's a silver logo, logo here. So something that I'm going to try and figure out throughout this video, what, what is it actually directed towards? And I think that's actually very important for educators because a silver player should be focusing on very, very, very different things to a diamond player, you know, and they could easily get roped in to overcomplicating the game um, through watching videos. And I've, again, this is something I've learned as a content creator as well. I've had to try and to be more specific. Ranked. The best players like Faker know that in order to climb the ranked ladder, it's not enough to just go even or generate small leads. You often need to crush your opponent. And this is exactly what... Well, again, I don't want to, sorry, I apologize if I'm, if I'm pausing too much here, but that's also not necessarily the case. Sometimes the game is going to give you an opportunity to take big leads because maybe that's what the mid-jungle permits or the matchup permits, but you don't necessarily need to always get giant leads. Maybe the matchup or the mid-jungle 2v2 doesn't go your way and maybe going even means you're winning. And in my experience, especially coaching below Emerald, Climbing is actually less about what you do. It's about what you don't do because most people just lose the games for themselves by doing dumb shit on repeats. So again, I, I, I don't know if I totally agree with that statement. Faker's smother technique will accomplish. And the best part is this technique is very simple to understand and execute. Whenever you have an advantage over the opponent, such as them being low in health, out of mana, behind in items, and you can't kill them for whatever reason, your goal should then be to just prevent the enemy from recalling and keep them in lane in their losing position as long as possible. This is because when an enemy is significantly weaker than you, whether it's because of this low health or mana, level or item differences, it means they will always impact any nearby fight that breaks out significantly less than you can. But enough theory about the strategy, let's actually jump into a real game Faker played where he shows this strategy in action. Here he's playing Gragas and is facing an Aurelia. He's currently ahead one level, 1000 gold of items, and Aurelia is low on health. The problem is Faker is currently low on mana and so there's no way to just straight up solo kill Aurelia at this moment. At the same time, you can see that the enemy Aurelia... Okay, so there's a few important details here that we really got to get into. So Rift is coming up in about 50 seconds. Faker also doesn't have TP. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming Aurelia doesn't have TP here. From the looks of things, it seems like his team is actually winning. It seems like his top has two plates. Um, they're up in gold. Um, I don't really know specifically who's fed and who's not. Um, it's very important that when using the technique that, you know, they're trying to kind of talk about here that we actually understand the state of the map. And this will make sense later on as we go into this, but I just want to kind of set the scene here. Aurelia is playing very far back and safe, forcing Faker to tower dive if he wants to get that kill. And you now know our main goal is to prevent the enemy from recalling and keep them in lane, which we'll go into more depth on shortly. However, the first step to mastering this strategy involves you understanding why the opponent can't just recall in these types of positions. If an enemy does recall, well, then you need to punish them by pushing a wave into the tower and deny the enemy all that golden XP from the minions. For example, you can see here Aurelia disappears into fog of war. Faker is now worried that she's recalling and so then looks to push in order to punish punish her recall. You can actually see how this forces Aurelia to stop her recall so she doesn't lose those minions to the tower. So you need to understand this. The threat of you pushing the wave into the tower is what punishes and often prevents an enemy from just recalling in a losing position. The thing is, if you're pushing, well, you're going to be much further up the lane and vulnerable to being ganked. And this is actually a good thing. Again, as a reminder, in this position, if a fight breaks out anywhere on the map, Faker will always get there first while also being able to impact the outcome of the fight significantly more. But most Okay, so it looks like what we're talking about here is we're looking at kind of like locking the enemy in lane and preventing them from recalling. Now, this is actually a very, it's a very, I wouldn't say a, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's niche, but there is very specific situations which you would want to do this and very specific situations where you most definitely would not want to do this. Now, in this specific situation, again, notice how I'm trying to bring it back to specifics because League is a game of specifics. You can't, there's no secret Krabby Patty formula that's going to get you LP. There's no, there's no crazy bullshit strategy that's going to get you LP. It's always the basics of the game. Like the, the game isn't designed, if you want to get long-term results, there's no gimmicks, right? So that's the first thing off the bat. Now, if there was a skirmish that would happen in the river right now, we kind of freeze frame right now, assuming Faker doesn't have biscuits at this point in time. Even if he theoretically has first move, he's going to be so oomed that he's not really going to be able to contribute anything anything to this fight anyway. So if Faker in this situation, maybe his team was winning, maybe his bot 2v2 was favorable, they're winning bot 2v2, and maybe his jungle was in a good position. 
you know, so his team is already ahead. By neutralizing the 1v1, that might be very good because it's like, well, my team's going to win anyway. They don't need me. As long as I keep this guy pinned under tower, we're automatically going to win. Um, in a scenario where the game's a lot more even, and maybe he's the one that has the lead, maybe he does, needs to be the difference maker here. Maybe he might need to go back and actually have spent gold, get to his Everfrost, and then he can actually do something. Or maybe he might not want to sit in here you know, with limited mana because that's going to prevent him from actually helping his team. So this sort of technique is very good if, um, if for example, your team is already ahead and you know by neutralizing this guy, you're already going to win. Um, or there's nothing else happening on the map and you're not really needed and you can just kind of stick in the isolated 1v1. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind. If a fight breaks out anywhere on the map, Faker will always get there first while also being able to impact the outcome of the fight significantly more. But most often, there will be no fights on the map or opportunities for you, just like in this case. So instead, by being this push... I don't really believe in that either, like often. Like, again, you can't think like that. It depends on the game. It depends on the situation. Right? If you've got a niddly jungle on your team that's permanently invading, chances are there is something that might happen. Right, So it depends on the pace of the game, it depends on the champions in the game. Up, you can actually lure junglers to try and gank you to relieve pressure on their losing lane. This is exactly what Faker wants and what you should want in your own games. Because if a jungler ganks Faker here, he'll simply turn on Aurelia to kill her and at worst trade one for one. Or the jungler will be forced into a 1v1 with Faker since Aurelia can't jump in without dying. On top of all of that, the enemy jungler still has to be worried about a counter gank which would completely crush them. So at this point, it's a losing position for the enemy. If they stay in lane, they either continue get zoned from last hits losing gold or get harassed down low enough to be killed through a tower dive or eventually a fight will break out somewhere they can't respond to without dying or a roam opportunity will open up for the opposing player so something to keep in mind here as well right what you'll see commonly as well some certain people might just you know they'll they'd be happy to go down minus six because they're like you know what if i actually just go down my uh aurelia as you know let's say that aurelia is a, maybe a different champion let's say that aurelia is like an ari or something like that and let's say in this scenario, Ari has, you know, a decent amount of gold and base and just wants to recall. Ari might be okay going down minus six, coming back with tempo over the Gragas such that she can be on the map before the enemy and maybe, you know, make a roam play or uh, or get to Rift Child first or whatever, you know? So, or maybe, you know, just maybe, you know, Gragas is the one with all the kills in this game. Therefore, he needs to be strong enough to actually allow his team to start rift maybe it's actually better off gragas he just gets this wave in allows this this uh Aurelia in this case to get all the farm actually takes the 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 reset takes the reset sacrifices denying cs to actually get tempo and then do something with that tempo this is also something that you can do um so again it really depends on the situation here in this particular situation i'm assuming his team's in a very commanding position he need to, and Aurelia. Denying Aurelia CS is actually very, very good because you're reducing, you're, you're making it very hard for her to get to Bork because she's a very item-reliant champion. Um, so denying Aurelia farm is actually extremely valuable. Uh, something to keep in mind as well. When you're in this position, the biggest key is to be patient, do as Faker does, and use the smother technique. You want to prolong the enemy's suffering for as long as possible while patiently waiting for an easy play to present itself to you. This is because the only way out of this position to lose the least amount possible is to do what you see this Aurelia does. You just recall. The problem is, that means you'll usually lose two waves of farm. That's nearly a... And, you know, we've got to keep in mind that, you know, Faker in this situation probably knows the enemy jungle has no threat onto him. You know the enemy. You know maybe the enemy jungle's behind, or that champion just doesn't do anything to Gragas. There's a lot of there's a lot going into this guy. There's a shit ton going into this. This is not an easy uh, thing to execute in the game for the average player. There's a lot going on. You got to be aware of your teammates' location. You got to be aware of the enemy jungle's location. You got to know how much threat they impose onto you. You got to be aware of support roams. There's a lot going on here kills worth of gold. Now listen up, because when you apply the smother technique, it's extremely important that if the enemy does choose to recall, you not only push that final wave to punish them, but also then match the opponent's recall. By pushing, you not only deny them farm to the tower, but just as important is by matching their recall, you prevent the enemy from spending their gold and getting back full resources, which will give them a temporary lead on you when they come back to lane if you don't recall yourself. All right, so you should now have a good idea of the basic theory behind this strategy. Up next, you'll be put through a test to see if you truly understand it. Before we do that though, I just want to mention guides like this are only possible because of our awesome subscribers at skillcap.com. I'm just going to skip over this. I'm not really interested in purchasing, purchasing their mid lane coaching. Here we go. Hello. Here, Faker is on Zed facing a Cassante. He gets a gank from his teammates that puts Cassante low on health and his flash on cooldown. As we get back to this wave, we can see Cassante is missing from vision. So if we're Faker, what should be our next move in this scenario? 
the timer, the pressure's on. We should be pushing out the lane. We have to assume that Kazante is trying to recall since he's low on health and isn't showing in vision, and pushing this wave into his tower is how we punish him for recalling. After pushing, Faker then begins channeling his up. What's the alternative here? I mean, the only thing we could really do here is shove no. I mean, you would never slow build if the enemy's low, because if you slow build, then they're just going to get a reset. Um, and you can't freeze, it's not going to freeze, so the only thing you could possibly do is hard shove, right? We should be pushing But I do like actually that style of uh, video making, to be honest. I actually think Skillcap do a very, very good job in terms of like the way they tell a story and, and, and uh, you know, getting the audience engaged. I think they, they actually do a very, very, very good job of that. So props to them, man. They've got some great editors and they definitely know how to make a video. Of the lane, we have to assume that Kazante is trying to recall since he's low on health and isn't showing in vision, and pushing this wave into his tower is how we punish him for recalling. After pushing, Faker then begins channeling his own recall as we taught you, but then we see Kazante picking up the wave at his tower, meaning he didn't recall after all. So, should we continue recalling or cancel it? Well, to be honest, it really depends on the situation, right? Sometimes if this next wave is a cannon wave and I have a giant base, and maybe if Dragon was coming up in 20 seconds, it would be better for me to actually let Cassante get this farm. I don't want to stick around over here. I just want to continue to get my farm, get back on the map with my key spike. It depends on how much gold I'm on. It depends if this is a cannon or not. And it depends on um, what my role is in the game and what, how I perceive what my job is in this game. We should cancel it, as we want to keep Kasante in lane, as we have the advantage. If we recall, it will always allow Kasante to shove out the next wave and recall after, giving him a way back into the game. You can see just how much map pressure you get with this technique. Kasante is literally pinned to his tower. So this is a, a situation where, you know, it, it, you know, Zed is incentivized to stay because the team is like kind of looking to invade. You've got a Kindred that's constantly invading. This Kasante is very low and you're playing a champion that has no mana. So we've got this massive resource advantage. We can actually continue to deny CS. Um, and because our team can do things with our prio, we're not just mindlessly we're not just mindlessly doing this for our one v one. We're also giving options to our team. This is very very valuable. If, for example, Kindred was maybe like, let's say if we go back here, let's say here Kindred um, was basing um, right now. To be honest, maybe Faker would have actually continued to recall to actually sync the recalls up with the jungler, potentially. Again, it depends if, if he has TP advantage or not, or again, how much gold he has. Maybe he needs an extra wave for a particular amount of items. It would depend on the situation. But I think in this particular situation, the, the Raptors are actually up. And so he probably also was considering, oh shit, yeah, my team can actually potentially invade the Raptors here. Maybe I can stay on the map and help them here. Cancel it, as we want to keep Kasante in lane, as we have the advantage. If we recall, it will always allow Kasante to shove out the next wave and recall after, giving him a way back into the game. You can see just how much map pressure you get with this technique. Kasante is literally pinned to his tower, unable to help with anything, while Faker is making it safe for his team to invade the enemy's jungle. The next wave arrives, and Kasante is nowhere to be seen. So, what should be our next move in this scenario? Well, again, given the team is in the area, Zed also has very good wave clear, right? So we could pretty easily get this wave and giving a little bit of tempo to Cassante wouldn't matter. So I think staying is completely fine. If we were playing Vlad or something with atrocious wave clear, then to be honest, I think basing would have also been completely fine. Again, we always have to assume that they're recalling, and our punish is to push the wave into the tower. We then see the enemy's jungler, Nico, is at the tower, meaning Kazante definitely committed to recalling. So, with that in mind, what should be our next move? We're gonna race it! We always need to recall after we push in order to match the opponent's recall. This avoids Cassante showing up back in lane with a health and item advantage over us. All right, so now you should have a grasp on the basics of this technique, but we haven't even got to the best part. The best part about the smother technique is that you can literally use it at any phase of the game. For example, here it's later in the game and Faker is in a side lane as Gragas as his bot lane has taken over mid lane. These are very common lane assignments as the game progresses. Now he did beat Aurelia in lane and is ahead in CS, kills and a level, but not ahead enough to just straight up tower dive Aurelia 1v1. And of course, the problem is, it really knows just that, and so is playing super safe just sitting at her tower. Again, this is when the smother technique will come in handy. If we look topside at this moment, we can literally see three enemy members ganking his top lane. It's very common in these positions to feel the pressure to have to do something, like you have to force a play to match the opponent or the game will start slipping away. But again, forcing plays that aren't there is the biggest reason why you're stuck in your rank. As long as we keep the enemy pinned at the tower, we can just patiently wait for an obvious winning play to react to first. In this case, it means we need to support our jungler taking dragon. Then, once we get back to lane, Aurelia is just playing 
safe under our tower, we can't forcibly push our lead. Instead, by pushing the minions... Yeah, and in this, again, this specific instance, if we kind of go back here, yes, there was not really much for Gragas to do. Even if Gragas were to hover mid, it's an Ezreal. You know, it's highly unlikely that we're going to be able to lock down that Ezreal and make that play. Um, and Poppy probably doesn't need us to help get the dragon because, you know, we actually see where they actually all are on top side of the map. There are many scenarios, though, where, again, if I'm playing a differing champion, maybe I'm playing Talia or something like that, it would actually be better for me to hover mid. Or maybe I'm playing Asol or something that can actually shove and move and hover mid. Maybe if my team was kind of had a bit of a stacked wave in mid, it'd actually be better for me to actually use the prior that I'm getting bought to actually pressure and look for a dive mid. So I do like the idea that we don't need to force something, and sometimes we, we can be content keeping this guy pinned under tower. But, I, you know... I am shit scared with this sort of content because you just get some guy, maybe so there's a talent main, a, a gold talent main looking at this and be like, yeah, I gotta, I better, you know, keep them pinned under tower because that's what, that's what Faker does. Faker does this smother, smother technique and that's what I gotta, I gotta do when in reality talent should never be doing this. Talent should just be shoving and moving and, and then hovering the team or something like that. You gotta always tie it back to the champ's identity. What does my champion really want to do? What is my role in the composition? What is the win condition? Um, so I, I just, I, I get shit scared of generalities because I, you can't think of league in generalities in this specific instance, because of these variables, this makes this specific decision well. And this is kind of the, 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 the line of thought that I want to kind of get across here. And I think that I, I do like the idea of people just kind of fucking around and just blindly doing this and feeling it out. Like I, so I don't want to completely shit on a skill cap for that. I think that it is good for people sometimes to try things and feel it and fail and learn. I think that's okay. But I think there could be a lot more depth in here about why specifically in this instance it works or why would be why would going mid be an actual forced play specifically. Forcing plays that aren't there, patient. And once we get back to lane, Aurelia is just playing safe under her tower. We can't forcibly push our lead. Instead, by pushing the minions, it forces Aurelia to react and be pinned to the tower to farm that wave or lose it and the tower along with it. We actually mentioned the importance of this concept during the laning phase as a way to prevent the enemy from recalling. However, as the game progresses, the reason we push and pin the opponent isn't just to prevent a recall. You see, if Faker were to freeze in this position, Aurelia could just always leave lane and start roaming to try and impact the map in an effort to get back into the game. So by pushing, we actually prevent this from happening and pin them to the tower. So as we push this wave again, we take a look to see if there's an obvious play for us to rotate to. And just like the majority of the time, there isn't a play for us. Instead, in this case, the play actually comes to us in the form of our jungler looking to tower dive. This sets up a super easy kill for Faker. It then results in Aurelia being denied a ton of farm to the tower, Faker taking plays, and the turret. This actually totaled over 1,000 gold gained for Faker in this one single play. But I know, you're already thinking, yeah, this won't work in my rank. My jungler would never tower dive for me. Well, don't worry. As remember, very shortly, I'll show you my results of using this in lower elo. But at the same time, this wasn't completely honest. I didn't actually show you the full clip. So if we go further back, we can actually see Faker teleported to bot lane, which initiated the lane swap. And after a bit of fighting, you can see how he has a health, mana, level, and item advantage on their bot lane. Again, we know to push to prevent them from recalling and forcing them to react to the wave. The problem is we can't tower dive as Fiddlesticks is threatening to defend with an- I love this. This is really good. They're actually getting into the details here, showing the context of the situation, showing the specifics. I think this is much better. Ultimate. So we just keep them pinned and use the smother technique. Next wave, we lose vision of the bot lane, so we push to punish and force them to stay. At this point, it's very clear bot lane committed to the recall, so we stay to take plates. No one comes to defend, and so we deny farm and get ahead in gold. We push the next wave. Again, no one is responding, and there's nothing for us to react to on the map. Next wave arrives. We there's a lot going on here. Very sophisticated threat assessment, but yeah, really good stuff from Faker. I don't really... This is really weird to me, because this to me, I don't really understand... This to me doesn't really click in terms of what we saw in the early lane and what we're seeing here. This to me seems like we're just kind of maintaining pr pressure, making people react to waves. We're not really necessarily locking anyone in lane, but I, I can kind of see how there is a rough connection here, but I do like the context. I do like the added context push it into the tower, and finally, Aurelia responds to come defend. It was at this point Faker rotated to help take the dragon. We then push the next wave, and it's only now an easy play opens up for us in the form of our juggler tower diving. What this means is that if we go back, it was around the 11 minute mark we started to implement the smother technique, and it wasn't until around 2 minutes and 30 seconds later an obvious play opened up. This is what I mean when I say you have to be patient with this technique. You can't just get paid off as soon as you try to implement it. It's I do agree that I like that line of thought where like you can do the right thing, you can kind of be doing all the right things and nothing will happen immediately it's like you will get the reward or the result the, i guess the uh get paid for all of the work that you put in way later on down the line i actually do like that that message
It's all about forcing the opponent into a lose-lose scenario. You're either going to gain map pressure that eventually turns into a winning play, or they're forced to take a bad recall, where you deny them a ton of minions to the tower. Now, of course, just because Faker uses a strategy in Korean Challenger doesn't mean it's automatically going to work for a regular player in lower ranks. So that's why I went out and tested the smother technique in ranks gold to platinum. Why gold to platinum, though? Well, literally 96% of the entire ranked player base is platinum or lower, so it's the best representation of what you're going to experience in your own games. And remember, I didn't just spam games and cherry pick the ones that worked. All replays of mine that you're going to see were the first six games I played. So for this first replay I want to go over, I'm in lane against a Galio, and I'm currently ahead of level and have double buffs. I look to push to pin the opponent down, but this also sets me up to land damage while they try to farm under tower to help push my lead further. We actually saw the same concept being used in the first game of Faker, where he was poking Aurelia down under tower after he pushed a wave. Next wave arrives, you know the plan, we want to push to prevent them from recalling. And again, I'm landing poke as I do this, continuing to build my lead. And as I push the next wave, remember, at this point, if I'm ganked, I can either just turn on the jungler, escape, or turn on Galio if he tries to escape. At the same time, if any play happens on the map, I can react to it first and be more impactful. Now, after I push this next wave into the tower, I want to highlight how I have a flash up in all of my abilities, including ultimate. Galio is definitely within my kill threshold here, and so I could go for it. This is, you know, you know, there's a lot going on here, right? You know, this Ari obviously has sophisticated tethering, landing beautiful cues onto the Galio, shitting on the Galio versus a very low threat jungler as well. So there's not really, we're not really, we can kind of do whatever we want. We've got beautiful vision set up here. There's a lot of kind of, there's a lot going on to this landing here, right? This Ari's obviously taken the time to, to, to get the good vision, has taken good trades in the first place, put themselves in a favorable position, maybe got even a kill or two leading up to this point of you know sitting on the uh sitting on the doubles itself. I don't really know what his score line is at this point. So he's obviously in a very, very good spot right now. So sure, if you're getting yourself into this sort of situation reliably as a goal player, not really knowing what to do with your lead is, in my opinion, a little bit disingenuous because if you're getting yourself into this situation, you're dominating your opponent this hard and you're doing all these things, you're warding, you're leaning, you're aware of everyone's location, you know where their jungler is. Dude, you're, you're, you're so far above a gold player. I literally have never, I don't see gold players with this sort of quality of laning. It's not... You would the players wouldn't be in this situation. They would either be sitting on a shit ton of gold. They would have mistethered, got completely chunked. They would have forgotten to ward. Something already terrible probably would have gone wrong. But given the giving him the benefit of the doubt, if there were someone in these situations consistently, then you know not too bad. You know, obviously this is something we can consider a charm flash combo to solo kill him. However, there's no need for me to force anything risky when I'm in such a dominant position. I want to be patient and just smother the opponent. And based on the replays we watched, the way I view it, you know, I don't really view the game in terms of risk. Risk is, it, look, it is a thing, but the way I view it, there is a, it, there either is an opportunity or there isn't an opportunity. The way you would look at it in this situation, if your bot lane were stacking a wave, right? And like a three stacked wave, and you know they're cast this top side, we should probably just dive bot. Now, if, you've, if your jungler's there and you've got a stacked wave, there is no risk. There is no risk at all, right? It depends on the situation. Now, if, if your team is low, or we don't know where their jungler is, or there isn't a stacked wave, then yeah, it might be a low percentage play. But if the variables are there and we see the variables, diving bot lane and getting a double kill for your bot lane would be infinitely better than just killing this Galio in lane. So... It, you know, I, I think that there there are situations where lock, staying in lane and, and locking this guy in lane and making this guy's miserable is 100% the right play. And there are situations where the game is even, we know where their jungler is, they're stacking ways, and we can boom, make a really, really high impact item on bot side. Alio is definitely within my kill threshold here, and so I could go for a charm flash combo to solo kill him. However, there's no need for me to force anything risky when I'm in such a dominant position. I want to be patient and just smother the opponent. And based on the replays we watched earlier Faker, I was actually fully expecting for Galio to do what Aurelia did, just back off and recall. Take the L, at which point I'd punish him by shoving a wave into the tower, and then matching his recall. Instead, they surprised me by going for this hero all-in in to get themselves out of the spot, which just simply would never work. But this was actually a huge lesson for me. When you watch this technique being used in Korean Challenger, naturally, there aren't many big mistakes like this. But in lower ranks, your opponent won't know how to react to this technique, so they often just force really bad plays trying to get out of it. For example, here I'm playing as Ari against Vigar. I teleport back to lane and find myself in a really nice advantage, where Vigar is low on health, mana, and hasn't spent his gold on items like I have. So I immediately recognize I need to implement this mother technique to either prevent him from recalling or punish him if he does recall. However, I want to highlight a nuanced trick that is super useful. Notice how I land one more Q on the wave, and then I stop hard pushing the wave. Well, this is very weird. I, I, I mean, I, you know, she, she, she's gone for the recall. 
mana and has Vigar should no matter what just recall on TP. Assuming maybe he doesn't have TP, maybe he has something else. I don't know what the situation is here. But the better play for Ari, actually, in my opinion, instead of just shoving this from the get-go, would actually just maintain the freeze. I don't really see the point in in starting a slow build here. You should actually hold the freeze, you would deny CS, let it crash, and then start your slow build. That's a much more effective way of actually denying more CS. He hasn't spent his gold on items like I have, so I immediately recognize I need to implement this mother technique to either prevent him from recalling or punish him if he does recall. Because we actually just broke the freeze right now. Why would we do that? We can just kind of freeze. If Vigar is competent, Vigar is just going to base TP. But if we, kept, if we kept this massive kind of freeze, it would deny actually CS the most optimal way. Then Vyga comes back, you, it crashes, and then we can bounce off and do that. So yeah, this is a very weird thing to do for Ari, in my opinion. However, I want to highlight a nuanced trick that is super useful. Notice how I land one more Q on the wave, and then I stop hard pushing the wave and instead primarily just last it. This is because Vygar isn't walking away from the lane into Fog of War and threatening to recall. So when an opponent plays like this and is just showing they're not recalling, you want to damage the wave enough so that it begins pushing, but then switch I think that is good advice. Like if someone, if you notice someone is overstaying and they're not recalling for whatever reason, then you should actually default to a slow build because a slow build, you'll be able to get more pressure um, and have a larger wave and you'd be able to kind of actually, you know, um, have more trading potential and you have more safety because the wave is bigger. And even if the jungle comes, you'll be able to kind of thwart it off relatively easily. It's just slow pushing so you can prolong the amount of time. So yes, this is actually very good advice. And they have to stay in lane. You can see how by doing this, it allows me to bait Vigar to move further up the lane to last it, at which point I land a charm and get his flash. After this, Vigar has now- And this is what I'm saying. This is where the disconnect, in my opinion, really begins. Because now we're just in the realm of like, yeah, sure, if you're a, a much better laner than your counterpart, you're going to get beautiful wage management, beautiful resets, beautiful trades, burn the flash in the 1v1 you know, not die to a gank. You're going to do all of these things. And of course, if you do all of these things, everything you do, with, obviously you're going to have the mental stack to think about what to perfectly do with the wave. In my experience, you know, what we're talking about here is having very sophisticated, everything, very sophisticated skill shot usage, tethering, spacing, warding and leaning, threat assessment. To, to do this effectively, you would have to have so many things. You would have to have such a freed up mental stack the average person is not capable of doing this. If this is in gold, I guarantee you this Ari is not walking past the wave to zone. I guarantee you. They, they, they wouldn't even, or, or, like, or they're going to already mess up in another way. They wouldn't have taken that beautiful tempo reset. Like, they would have messed up in the in the first place, or they would have taken bad trades early, or, or whatever. It's, it's just, this is what leaves me with, like, the information is fundamentally good. But why do this in a, in a weird lower elo bracket? This is here, in my opinion, everything we're talking about here is a high level concept. This, at least the way I believe this, what I've seen get results for my clients, and this is the raw gameplay of the average gold and platinum player. This is not, this is not necessarily feasible for them. This is not where they need to be directing their attention. There are many, many other more important things, like for example, playing playing off their key spikes, being aware of their teammates location, being aware of the next neutral objective, making sure they're getting good quality resets, um, understanding the matchups and the trading patterns. These are understanding the range difference between champions and understanding how your kits fundamentally interact, developing threat assessment, how much threat does the enemy jungle have onto you. These are things that are so much more important what we're seeing right now is this is something I would really go deeper on with maybe a Diamond Plus client or maybe a High Emerald client. Definitely not a Gold client, that is for sure. So I just feel I just feel like this doesn't make sense to me personally. You can prolong the amount of time they have to stay in lane. You can see how by doing this, it allows me to bait disappeared into Fog of War. This is when I know I need to push fast now to punish him if he's recalling and try to bait him into staying. And unfortunately for Vygar, he has decided to stay, which again is a huge mistake. He's way too low on health. And again, just like we saw really do in the Faker replay, he needs to recall and take the L, but instead is making the same mistake we saw Gap. There's no L here because he should theoretically, I don't know why he wouldn't have TP. He should just base and TP right now and come back and he would be completely fine because the wave's just coming into him. For Vigar, and again, just like we saw really do in the Faker replay, he needs to recall and take the L, but instead is making the same mistake we saw Galio make, trying to stay. Surprisingly, I actually got a tower dive from my jungler. This is in high gold, low platinum after all. And so now Vigar not only dies, but still loses the minions on top of it. I want to emphasize though, this tower dive is not needed. It's a lose-lose position for Vigar. If we go back to when the wave crashes, we'll either solo 
will kill him by landing a charm or getting him lower and lower on health from harass. Or we'll just be able to react to a play on the map that he can't. Or he finally accepts that he has to recall and we deny a wave or two to the tower. To actually prove this, if we fast forward a bit, obviously from the earlier play, I'm now ahead on Vygar. Because of this, I start pushing him to pin him down. I look to land poke while he's distracted with the last hits in her tower in an effort to then further snowball. Next wave arrives, again push it to smother the opponent, and I actually spot a fight happening topside, and so I use my lane priority to react to it first. In this case, the fight was resolved very fast, and so they didn't need my help anymore. But you can see how if this wasn't the case, I'd be able to clean up the fight while Vigar couldn't contribute anything. So I turn around and head back to- You know what's interesting, Ian, this is great, right? But what's the alternative? You're not really going to be able to slow build into this matchup in particular anyway, especially, I mean, look, if you're that far ahead, maybe. But for the most part, you, you really don't have a, a, an alternative because Vigar can thin the way from a distance with Qs and Ws. You're not going to freeze because when nine, you know, nine minutes into the game, you'd never freeze and you're playing Ari and you want to be shoving and moving. That is Ari's reference point post level, especially post lost chapter, lost six. A lot of time you're just shoving in, starting to get prior so you can complement your secondary win condition and specifically your jungler. So I don't really understand what the alternative is here. You know, of course you're going to be shoving right now. So I don't really know if this is a sophisticated smother technique. And by the way, you know, something to keep in mind, this is, this is not trademarked to Faker. Every high elo challenger Korean player, like decent mid laner does this. The best who's actually at it, if you really want to see this done the best, is actually specifically Chovy. Um, because Chovy puts himself in this situation many, many, many times because of how good he is in the 1v1. Um, so something to keep in mind. Lane, again, pushing the wave, landing more and more damage on Vygar. And there's just so, notice how there's so much going on here. I just want to highlight a few things, like the beautiful skill shot accuracy, all this beautiful stuff. Specifically as well, if we kind of go back here, look at this great tethering here after this i think it was around here this i start pushing him to pin him down i look to land poke while he's distracted with look at the great tethering in a second of the the Vigar cage the last hits on her tower in an effort to then you know what i would see if this was in platinum the Vigar cage lands the kazix comes from top side ari burns r defensively boom ari can't do anything well jack you can't do jack shit with the prior anyway because you have no r that's typically the quality of the mistake that I would be looking for. <laughs> this beautiful tethering, jungle tracking awareness, not dying to gangs, having flash and R available, having the mental capacity to be aware of your jungle's location. This stuff is <laughs> so far above gold and platinum, it's, it's not even funny further so we're forced to push this wave to punish him Vigar then doesn't show so it's clear that he has committed to his recall and so again like we taught you i know to match his recall so he doesn't show up with more health mana and a possible item advantage on me the so that is good advice i like that they're really bringing it back to you. if they reset you should probably be considering resetting because you don't want to create a difference in the resources problem is in this case Vigar has teleport meaning he's not going to lose any minions to the tower and with how popular teleport is right now it's actually quite common for this to happen but the thing is since i push the wave first and then recall I can still just walk back the lane in time to pick up the next wave without losing any farm. This means, yes, I didn't deny him minions, but I put his teleport on cooldown. Meanwhile, my teleport is still up. That's a huge advantage that was... But how come we didn't talk about Vigar missing the reset window before just TPing back and completely negating the play? It's like, it's weird. It's like we just kind of cherry picked when Vigar... It's like whenever Vigar does something good, but don't worry, I've done that. Or if he does something bad, it's like, that was my plan. That was all my strategy. It just seems a little bit disingenuous, at least to me anyway. Created from the smother technique. Next wave is arriving, and of course, with my lead, I'm going to push to smother Vigar. I didn't realize this until looking at the replay, but this Vigar has actually been spam pinging his jungler ever since that first tower dive. And I actually catch him out here, just standing still, clearly typing, flaming his jungler to land an easy trade. The reason I mention this is that this technique is extremely stressful to be the victim of. It just feels like you're being slowly strangled with no counterplay, and so players often get extremely frustrated when playing against it. Now, as I crash this wave, I believe this to be a pretty big mistake, that you guys can learn from. Instead of just maintaining this pressure and let it build, I look for a big play by landing a charm under tower. But this only results in me taking a ton of tower damage and basically trading even. This was just an unnecessary risk, and you can see how if an enemy ganked me, I could easily end up losing my lead. You can also see how I was then forced into trying to make a charm flash play after as I realized I was going to- This is all this stuff is like not playing in accordance with your champ's identity. After Ari post level nine, we shouldn't even really necessarily be interacting with Viagra anymore. We should be shoving and hovering and complimenting our team. Now, I don't know exactly what's happening on the map right now, but this is very, very rare that you would see this sort of scenario, especially in this particular matchup because Vigar's meant to beat Ari. So this is a very, very weird scenario. But yes, I guess the point being, you know, don't go crazy or whatever, but 
Again, this is very quant kind of unique, you know. Lose the sustain war if I stayed in lane. I basically just got super lucky and I'm bailed out by my jungler, which makes it look like I used the smother technique successfully to set like all of this up. And the reason I'm highlighting all of this is to show you not to get too ramped up in results oriented thinking. In reality, I made a mistake when I went for that charm under tower, which easily could have resulted in me dying if I didn't get lucky by having a better jungler. So make sure you don't fall into that trap. Try to analyze whether your decisions increase the probability of something good to happen instead of just determining whether something was the right choice based on the outcome all right now I'm i like that i like that it's obviously easier said than done for the average person i think especially in your lower elo brackets when something positive happens usually it's a sign that something positive happened but it is good to double check so i don't mind that that message in the next game i'm already against an anivia things are relatively even until i was able to land a charm to get a big winning trade obviously now i know to default into smothering i'd like to maintain the push to prevent or punish a recall and as we taught you earlier, pushing means you will be attracting more attention to your lane. However, I'm full health, I have flash up, and Anivia is very low in health, making it difficult. Look at these beautiful cues of the Aris landing. Difficult for her to just walk up to try and set up a gank. So when Evelyn shows up, I'm easily able to just walk away from it with very little threat. Then once she leaves, I'm again right back into smothering. At which point, Evelyn then shows up again, trying to gank to relieve the pressure. This is another super advantageous outcome. You're completely wasting the enemy juggler's time, having them fall behind in farm, preventing them from a success. This has nothing to do with the smothering technique. Absolutely nothing. This is all the result of beautiful jungle tracking, warding, and leaning. Right? This is nothing to do. What? What? You could do whatever the hell you want with the wave. It could be a neutral state. It could be shoving. It could be slow building. It could be hard shoving. It doesn't matter. Your ability to waste the jungler's time has very little to do with this. The only thing that we've done to create this scenario is that yeah, we've taken excellent trades and landed most of our cues onto the Anivia. So the Anivia is getting low. Therefore, the you know this guy's probably is pinging for assistance. If we hadn't taken those amazing trades then sure, maybe the situation is different. But nonetheless, I just, I don't see how these kind of coincide for me personally. Let's full gank on any of your teammates and revealing them on the map. All right, so what was the outcome of using the smother technique in lower ranked games? Well, it had a very significant positive impact in three out of the six games I played. On top of that, I found it was actually far more effective in these lower ranks since players didn't know how to react and would constantly make it even worse for themselves by forcing a mistake instead of simply recalling and losing a wave or two. I was also pleasantly surprised at how often my own jungler would see my lane opponent was low and look to play off it in some way. However, if I'm being honest with you, I think the most valuable takeaway for you guys is about the mentality. Most players don't have a realistic expectation on how leads are pushed in league, specifically at how fast they happen. You often can't force things by yourself and instead you need to realize if you're in a winning position, it's often better to just prolong that winning position as long as possible until the opponent makes an obvious mistake that's easy to capitalize on. And as we both saw in the Korean challenger replays and in the low elo replays, this can mean staying in that winning position for minutes at a time until that opportunity presents itself. So the next time you find yourself in a winning position, instead of asking, what should I do next to push this lead further? Instead ask, what can I do to maintain this advantage and prevent the opponent from resetting to neutral? Or we can ask the question, uh, you know, who is my secondary win condition? When is my next key spike? Uh, what does my champion fundamentally want to do in this game? Right? I, again, I don't really... Yeah, this is... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's okay. I just think that there's a... Especially if we're talking specifically for gold and platinum, which is kind of what it seems to what, what rank this is kind of directed at. Um maintaining an advantage in lane it's just general it depends on the champion if i'm playing talon i don't give a shit i'm not even going to be in this scenario if i'm a fizz i'm probably not in this scenario either if i'm a vlad maybe and i want to isolate the 1v1 and prevent the enemy from tempo resetting and roaming great thumbs up this would be an amazing thing to do but if i'm playing ari i probably don't want to delay my lost chapter and you know what rather than talking about kind of all these i guess you know, I kind of look like a, just a salty, you know, mad at skill capped here. I have nothing against skill capped. I don't really give a shit here. I'm just kind of, you know, critiquing this video. I'm going to show you an example of this sort of thing going wrong. So this is a scenario of me actually playing versus, I think this guy's like the rank 10 Jace or rank 10 challenger player on my server. I was in a very commanding position. I was taking excellent trades. I had a resource advantage, um, doing a very good job. Now, Ari, Ari's specific reference point is that you really, really want to get to your lost chapter in level seven. And that's when you can really kind of start to shove and move and complement secondary win conditions. And, you know, it's typically timed with Rift Herald as well. What happened though, I got too tunneled on the 1v1. I got too tunneled and trying to shut down this guy in lane and really prevent him from doing anything. So what actually happened, I kind of shoving, bullying, you know, getting into a good position here, to, you know, making his life miserable, whatever. But you know what? By staying and trying to maintain pressure like this, I missed my reset window. 
I'm sitting on Lost Chapter Gold. Rift Herald's coming up in about a minute from now. I've got a Hecarim that I need to complement. And so what happens, the, the lane goes on. And we fast forward a little bit here. Yes, I have first move, but I'm moving to this play on 11, about 1,200 gold, very little mana. And even though I theoretically have first move, my life would have been 10 times easier if I actually had reset on that slow build into a reset on a cannon wave. Released, took my foot off the gas a little bit, come back with my lost chapter, replenish my seaport stacks, and then I would have been actually at this play, boom, 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 with my lost chapter, and I, and I would have been in a much more commanding position. Right? And so so this play ends up kind of somehow working, and it was a little bit of a weird scenario, and I'd make getting like a play onto the Malphi. But this was, in my review, when I reviewed this, a mistake. It was a mistake for me to stay here. I missed my reset window. I wasn't playing in accordance to my champion's identity. I wasn't playing. I wasn't doing my job. And this is just one of thousands of situations that the average player is going to be sitting in. League is a game of nuance. This is, this is my point. League is a game of nuance. We can't have this generalized approach. Now, I understand skill capped are just trying to get you guys thinking and stuff about the game. I, I get it. And maybe I'm just, you know, out of touch with content. I don't, I, don't, I don't fucking know. At least for me, I don't understand this. I don't think it's useful. Um, and I think, if anything, actually, I think it's detrimental to most players' journey because they're just going to be overcomplicating things, trying things, getting upset that they can't do things without realizing all of the, the skills that go into actually executing a play like that. So anyway, that's just my two cents. Um, if you have any thoughts, let me know. Otherwise, uh, good luck with your solo, you guys. Cheers.